Okay, good mo good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Welcome to a new session. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so could one of us please lead us in prayer? Uh, maybe Prabhakar, can you can lead us in prayer, please? Can I pray? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Father, yes, is this Kennedy? Yeah, yeah, it's me. Our Heavenly Father, go ahead. Over. Heavenly Father Jehovah, we thank you for today. Thank you for the good day and the good breath that you've given to us, Father Jehovah, as we go on before you to be taught by your servant, Pastor Emmanuel, the community you're going to bring heart, Father Jehovah. So we are going to learn for the quality before your honor and glory. I pray, trusting in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy. All right. Uh, so before we begin, let's just do a quick review of what we did last week. Uh, last week, we looked at something very important that was characteristics of a genuine revival or a genuine visitation of God. Uh, and so we looked at Matthew chapter 7 and drew principles from the whole thing where Jesus says a good fruit will bear, a good tree will bear good fruit. The bad tree will bear bad fruit. And uh, Jesus goes on to explain that we shall be known by our fruits. And so we picked out uh, uh, many characteristics from this whole uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, the small portion. Uh, we saw that a revival cannot be manufactured. It's not something that is man-made. Right? It is a work of God. And we saw that in every revival, Jesus is exalted. Uh, there is there's also sound doctrine. There can't be a revival where there is, you know, wrong teaching or wrong uh, false dogma being taught, right? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, the, only the truth of the Word of God will be preached, right? And so we saw that in a revival, always Jesus is exalted, not an individual, and there's proclamation of sound doctrine. Uh, another very important aspect we saw was uh, in, in revival is the unity in the spirit. Uh, every revival that we saw, we saw that there was unity uh, right from the early church. Every move of God, every visitation of God, there was unity among the people. There was oneness. There was no division. There was no, okay, uh, ministers and then laity and uh, no. They were all standing on level ground. Right? Uh, another characteristic of a revival was people were brought to intimacy, Christ likeness, and there was long lasting fruit. Right now, Jesus says in Matthew seventeen twenty seven twenty, he says, "Therefore you shall be know you shall know them by their fruits." A very important characteristic of a true revival or a move of God is there is lasting, you know, fruit. Uh, the, the lives that are being transformed is a lasting impression. It's not just a whiff of emotions, right? But there's lasting fruit. And we looked at two examples. We looked at how Nikki Gumbel, uh, who founded the Alpha course who started off very small with about a hundred people uh, but he had visited the Toronto revival he came back and all of a sudden in two years about 27,000 I think that's 20 yes 26,700 <clears throat> students started attending the alpha course and then they began to spread worldwide so what do we see here we see long lasting fruit right uh, Nikki Gumbel went he took part in the uh, Toronto revival. When he came back, uh, he saw that that spark of revival began to manifest in the place that he is in. And we saw that the Alpha course, that which is even running now, which many people all across the world, uh, you know, uh, they, they, you know, partake in this, uh, you know, uh, Alpha course. And so there is long lasting fruit. Then we also saw Heidi Baker's ministry, how God used this wonderful woman who went to Mozambique, started this ministry. It was very difficult on her mental, physical stress. 
lack of financial support, lack of medical facilities. And so she went through uh, uh, sicknesses in her own body. And then she came back uh, to her hometown to get some you know, medical aid and some rest for her body. And then she decided, I'll go to the Toronto Revival. And after that, she felt a whole new you know, uh, a strength in her body, strength in her mind. The Lord Jesus appeared to her, ministered to her. And then when she went back to Mozambique, all of a sudden, uh, what was just few people, few children that they were supporting, they started supporting about 10,000 children a day, feeding them uh, all three meals. 4,000 odd uh, families brought to Christ and 10,000 odd churches and Iris Ministry, which uh, you know Heidi Baker has, uh, operates all across the globe. So we saw last week that we as believers shall be known by our fruit. Right? Even as we are pursuing revival, uh, it, it doesn't mean that only a revival Okay, we will know them by their fruit. No, even in our personal lives, uh, you know, Jesus very clearly says, we ourselves shall be known by our fruit. Right? So it's very important that even as we pursue God, even as we, you know, uh, pray and seek God, and as we walk this life, uh, that we remember that we need to bear fruit in God's kingdom. So we'll pick up from here. Uh, we'll continue. I'm on page 86. So now that we've been looking at all of this, let's ask us this question. Can we have a visitation of God? And we've been studying about all this. Can we have a visitation of God? And how is it going to happen? Uh, we don't know when. We don't know where. But there are certain things that we have to do. right? But can we have a visitation of God? Let's look at this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. It's a powerful verse. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's telling them something. He's telling them, listen, you have all these gifts. You're, you're, you're a wonderful uh, church community in a uh, you know, very you know, popular place in Greece. Uh, but here's the thing. Whatever you're doing, was 1 Corinthians 3.9. We, for we are God's fellow workers. Right? So even as you know, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he's telling them, even as you do what you're doing, remember that you are God's fellow workers. Yes, Charles. Oh, thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, you, you are talking about uh, can we have God's visitation? Um, in 2020, yes. uh, Bin Hin was in Ghana. And during his presentation as she as he preached, he says, I see revival in 2022 in Uganda. And now 2022 is on the doorway. So um, uh, do we have examples of revivals and visitations that had been prophesied and they took place? Um, just to inquire. Thank you. Okay, yes, that's a good question, Charles. Thank you for asking that question. Right, uh, so as far as what we know, nobody uh, like really prophesied, like if we look at, so since we're doing church history, if, if you're asking in terms of church history, uh, there was nobody who prophesied and said, you know, uh, okay, the, uh, uh, revival is going to come in this place, revival is going to come in that place. But what we did see and what we did notice was, Charles, that the believers, the pastors or the believers were hungry for God. And so all they wanted to do was they wanted to see a move of God, right? So they went on together, got together, prayed, seek God, fasting and all of that. Uh, but there is no account in church history where somebody prophesied. And then as they prophesied, it, it happened exactly that way. And, uh, so uh, as far as I know, uh, there is no you know, prophecy that has been uh, you know, said that, you know, this, for example, the nation of uh, Africa or East Africa is going to see revival in 2020, uh, you know, maybe uh, in one year. 
but we don't see it mentioned right uh, it could have happened right it could be that there were plenty of prophecies made and those prophecies may have come true uh, but here's the thing uh, you know for uh, people can we can prophesy we can say all these things but that's why we are coming to this place where we're saying we are fellow workers with god so it's not only about just prophesying about something but it's also about working towards it right if you look at even in our personal lives and we're, when you're praying for something maybe somebody prophesies over you for example let me just take this example somebody a great man of god comes and prophesies over you saying that uh, you are going to be a you know wonderful worship leader a great worship leader in the next you know maybe 5 years now when we know that or so you know god somebody has god has spoken through somebody there is something that we have to do right for example we got to you know start singing or probably if it's uh, learning an instrument start learning an instrument uh, and, and so those practical things are there but to answer your question charles uh, there is no account of people prophesying about revival and the revival happening but there could be uh, but you know i'm not uh, really sure as to i haven't read any account of it so uh, because revival is something which god does in his way in his time right so uh, so we're not really sure when and how it's going to happen uh, but you're saying that they prophesied for 2022 some one of the things that we have to do is uh, you know the whole nation the leaders could get together and pray for that prophetic word to come into uh, you know existence come to become true in their lives so that that's why i said if somebody prophesied and we don't do about anything about it but just wait around it does not work right so there's a part that we all have to play as it answer your question charles thank you so much pastor okay thank you charles right so first corinthians 39 for we are god's fellow workers revival is a pure work of god so let's picture this right if we are god's fellow workers right uh now god desires that he pours out his presence upon his people his glory upon his people and we are called to be god's fellow workers so if we get together we say god this is your desire and we are praying for it that you fulfill your desire upon this land god will make it come to pass right why because we are god's fellow workers god does not look down upon us and say okay these are human beings who i have created so i will choose to do how i want to do no yeah, we are we are fellow workers with god right now the the moment we ask god for things that is i mean for, for example we go out of context and we ask god for things that he uh, you know that's not really needed and all of it then you know we can't say god you're my fellow worker so you have to do this for me no when when god desires a work that he wants to do and when we pray in line with that god will pour out his presence upon us there will be an outpouring right as a people you and i can prepare and pursue for the outpouring of his spirit here's an important thing there is no set formula there is no set rule as to what causes an outpouring right we cannot replicate it we cannot say okay god in the uh, in the first century church this is how you did it so i'm going to do the same way i'm going to pray like this or in the second um, uh, outpouring great awakening this is how you did and so i'm going to follow it this way uh, so we cannot replicate what god has done in the past right god can use different ways to through different mediums and different people to do his work right let's picture this in acts chapter 19 paul is in a second missionary journey is going about to these wonderful places now mostly in uh in Greece uh 
uh, Athens and Corinth and uh, Asia Minor as well. And so he's doing a powerful work there. He's, you know, in the name of Jesus, he's been, uh, uh, you know, uh, praying for the sick, healing the poor, healing the uh, blind and the deaf, many healings and workings of miracles. And here there's this Acts 19, the sons of Sceva. What do they do? He said, hey, let us also go and try to, you know, uh, exercise some demons out of people in the name of Jesus. So they go out. And what do they do? They, they say, uh, in the name of Jesus, whom Apostle Paul preaches, we command you to get out of this body. And the, uh, you know, the demon overpowers them and the possessed man overpowers them and beats them up. Now, this is a very important thing that we must understand, that when we are praying or when we are asking God for an outpouring in our midst, it is not a formula, right? Sometimes we say, uh, we, we use formulas in, in our lives, right? Oh, I have to say it like this. Only then, you know, God will listen to me. No, no. It's not a formula. In the name of Jesus, when we pray, it's not, uh, it's not just a, you know, a formula that we use. Okay, we pray whatever we want to pray and then just end it in Jesus' name and that's great. No. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are to know the authority that the name of Jesus holds. What happened to the sons of Sceva? They, they knew the name of Jesus, but they didn't, did not know the authority that that name holds. Right? And so here's the thing. An outpouring of God is not a, a formula. If we want to see a move of God in our own lives, in our church, in our uh, you know, in our cities, we must know that, hey, we are serving a powerful God, a, a wonderful God, a loving God. And we should really know uh, than just it being a formula, right? So now we'll just look at what are some of the variations, meaning how, how does God, uh, you know, send his revival upon his people. Just a few points here. First one, the time God chooses, right? Sometimes God can pour out a revival when there's spiritual and moral decline. Or sometimes God can pour out a revival when there is, you know, constant prayers going on uh, in the cities and in the nations. Right? So sometimes it could be just a deadness. So if we see the North American revival, uh, remember that, you know, uh, the layman's revival we also, where America was going through a moral decline, economic crisis, uh, churches were empty, and just a few people sat and prayed 12 in the afternoon to 1 o'clock, uh, 12 to 1, just for an hour. And we see that when they prayed, God began to work in their midst. Right? So sometimes God can pour out a revival when the things are very bad. Or sometimes even God can pour out the uh, 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 outpouring or a revival when people are pursuing after God. Right? Uh, now, for example, when we look at all around us, uh, in our nation, in the nation of India right now, we're seeing that uh, there's a steady increase in persecution. And what is also happening is that usually these persecutions would happen in towns and villages, but now it's coming into the cities. Right? Uh, uh, the Karnataka has, uh, the government of Karnataka has issued a, um, a bill for anti-conversion, uh, and it's coming into the cities. It's creeping in into the cities, uh, and there may come a time when you know the spiritual fervency may come down. Or there they may come a time when the spiritual fervency may go even more higher than usual. And that's when we can expect an outpouring or a move of God. Right? So God chooses how he goes about doing it. Remember, our responsibility is to just keep praying. Right? Preparation and waiting is, is never a wasted time. Right? 
uh, when we are praying and preparing and asking God, it's not that if we don't see an outpouring, oh, I have wasted my time. I've wasted five years you know, just praying and uh, asking God for revival and I don't see a revival. It's not a waste. Right? The more we are praying for it, the more we are getting closer to God. And I always say this to our church folks as well. I always say that preparation time is never wasted time. Waiting time is never wasted time. Look through the scriptures and we see that God made his people wait. Moses waited 40 years. Paul waited 17 years. David waited 17 years to become the king. And so we see that these waiting periods are all right. Just makes us stronger. So don't lose hope when, you know, we may be praying for an outpouring and we're not seeing it. Remember, it's just a preparation. The more we are doing this, the more... We are going closer to God. Two, the duration of sowing and praying. Sometimes revival, revival happens in a few months of prayer. Sometimes it takes years. If you remember the uh, Scotland revival, I uh, mentioned it once, how this man, Robert Murray McShane, he was praying for revival for many years, right? about five to six years in his church. There were about 50 or 60 people in his church. He's praying for revival. Nothing's happened. Five, six years, it's, the church has just become about a hundred people. And then he had some sickness and then he had to go on a leave. One young man comes, W.C. Burns, a young pastor, just about 26 years old, takes on the church. All of a sudden, you know, thousands of people started coming to this church and he has no idea what's happening. Right. So. The, he didn't call people for fasting and prayer and he didn't call people for, you know, uh, pray for revival. He doesn't, he didn't, you know, he just come to take the position of a pastor in a small church. But God decided at the sowing time of that Robert Perry McShane did about seven years, the reaping happened when this young man came. So the duration of sowing in prayer may vary from uh, from different kinds of revival. So God may decide to pour out you know, or do a powerful work in a certain place just with maybe one year of prayer. But in another place, God may wait for 10 years. Right uh, Now, is it that God is showing favoritism? Is it that okay, God likes that place more than this place? No. Uh, this is that God decides how he goes about it. He knows what's best and how to go about it, right? So the duration of sowing in prayer and uh, uh, is different from different revivals. Three, another variation is the place that God chooses. Sometimes it's a city, sometimes it's a town, sometimes it's a village, sometimes it's uh, uh, college campuses, sometimes God uses old people, uh, at times God uses young men, lay people. God can use anybody, right? So the layman's revival was just six men praying in the lunch break. And I remember the revival at, the, at Hawaii uh, or Hi Hybrids Island, three old women uh, in their 80s, got together and spent time in prayer. Right? And God moved in that place. Uh, and the hybrid island is just a very small place, which had about only about 20,000 people living in that uh, town. But then we also see revival happening in New York City, which had thousands of people. So where God pours out that revival is also up to him. God, God chooses the place, right? Next one, we see that God can use any kind of people. We saw that he can use the educated, the uneducated, the young, the old. He can use a preacher. He can use a woman. He can use a young girl. He can use a young boy. He can use lay people. He can use anybody he wants to spark a revival. Right? Remember Heidi Baker? She was just a young woman. She just got married. Right? And went to Mozambique. But God chose her. And God chose her to, you know, do this wonderful work. Amy Carmichael came to India uh, to, you know, to just uh, help the children 
were orphanages, uh, by starting up orphanages. God used these young women. And then the other side, God used older men. God used insignificant men, un uneducated folks. Um, uh, who, uh, was that, I think it was uh, Charles Spurgeon who was, you know, not really well educated. But God used him. Uh, and then you got the people who are very well educated. God used them as well. So remember this, God is not a respecter of persons. Right? It's not like God is saying, okay, uh, uh, show me your BTH certificate and then I will decide if I can pour out your, you know, my spirit upon your place. We know that God does not do that. God is no respecter of persons. God looks at our heart. He looks at our desires. Is this true? Is this genuine prayer? Are the motives of this prayer genuine? Right? And then he, he just pours out his spirit. He can use anybody. And so we, we as believers need to be open to that. God can use different ways of igniting a spark of revival among people. Right? Sometimes it is through collective prayer. Sometimes it is through uh, preaching. Sometimes it's just through the singing of songs, worship, or uh, a, an individual seeking God. So it depends on how, uh, you know, but God chooses that. Now, we may be, uh, maybe uh, God has put in our heart to have times of worship. Maybe at somebody else, God can put in their heart to spend times only reading the word. Right? Another person, God can say, okay, I want you to pray, spend hours in prayer. So uh, the spark that ignites this revival is different from different people. Right? And so we must be open to that as well. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit can be different from different uh, revivals. We see that in some places there are weeping and moaning. Some places there are wonders, signs, wonders, miracles. Some places there's rejoicing. Or it could also be a combination of all of them. Right. So basically what we're trying to say is that revival is a sovereign work of God. Right? It, is, it is God's work. And since it's God's work and since we are God's fellow workers, we have an important part to play. We have an important part. Uh, our part is to prepare and pursue for revival till it comes. And maybe we've been praying for five years now. Let's continue. Maybe we're praying for 10 years now. Let's continue. Right? So we prepare and we pursue until it comes. Now always remember this. We are, we'll look at that also a little later on. We as believers should understand that the more we, you know, spend time in God's presence, the, the Bible teaches us that he's changing us from glory to glory, right? And we may be praying, God, pour out revival, pour out an outpouring, and uh, let there be a move of God. Let your presence manifest. Let the Holy Spirit bring conviction. We may be praying this one year, two years, and sometimes we may lose hope. We may get discouraged. Our faith may get low. It is a common thing, right? But remember that what you have been praying for all these years is not a waste because... The more we are in God's presence, he's changing us from glory to glory, right? strength to strength, right? uh, precept upon precept. He is building us up. Right? It's not like, oh, I, you know, as I mentioned, it's not like, okay, we prayed five years, let's move on, let's change our prayer points. No, we can continue. We pursue until God moves. Right? So let's look at I'm on page 87. How can a local church community prepare itself to receive, steward, and release an outpouring? Now, imagine this. There's a church in the city. Suddenly, there's an outpouring of God. 
So what must we do? We must be prepared. Right? We should not be unprepared. We must be prepared. Right? Let's read Luke chapter 14, 28 to 30. Verse 28 to 30. Can one of us please read that? Luke 14, verses 28 to 30. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Right. Thank you, Anita. So this is, you know, it's, it's such a practical uh, saying that what Jesus is speaking. Imagine if somebody here it's mentioned tower, but I, I think the uh, the other translation also says if you're building a home, right? So imagine you're building a house, right? And you say, okay, I'm going to build a house now. Now, does a person go and say, okay, I'm going to build a house, uh, and so he just begins to build it? If he does that he's not well prepared because he's going to start building. Then he'll realize, hey, I thought I could finish building this entire house in this certain uh, X amount of money, but it looks like I need double the X amount of money to complete this house. And now I'll just have to stop the work. What does it say there? Let's, verse 29, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock at him. They're saying, hey, this guy, this person did not plan. He did not count the costs. Right? So it's important to you know, plan and prepare before you do anything in life. Right? Uh, I, I know, uh, maybe some of you have heard of this famous saying, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. When we don't plan, we are preparing ourselves to fail. Everything needs to be planned. Right? So we're going to look at two key preparation processes in terms of how to receive this revival, how to steward it, and how to release it. Right? Uh, how to release it to different uh, communities and different cities and be a, a source of revival. First one, prepare people. Right? In preparing people, we ourselves need to walk as an example, right? We have to walk as an example. Now, we need to put away sin, put away worldliness, put away childlessness, strife and competition, all these desires of recognition, position, all these things, we need to put it away and walk as an example. If you notice, the followers will be just like the leader. Right? So, for example, if you've got a leader, uh, not only in ministry, but in any other, uh, even in the corporate sector. So if you've got a leader who's always fighting and shouting at his, uh, you know, his team members, how do you think the team members are going to be? Team members, oh, man, I have to go to work. This, and this person's going to keep shouting at me. And, and then they would get angry. They don't want to work. It's just going to be a complete breakdown. Right, but picture you have a team leader or a manager who's very, very uh, a person who's understanding, uh, uh, and he understands. He's open and uh, he cares for his team, and so the team members are free to go and discuss, uh, you know, their you know, personal challenges or the work challenges that they have. So what's going to happen? You you see that the atmosphere in the team is like, hey, I'm going to do my best for this you know, manager. Why? Because he is a good person. He, he has been helping me and, uh, you know, uh, I want to do my best. That's the attitude you'll get. But what if uh, this other team leader is only shouting and, you know, always, you know, mocking and saying things and, you know, uh, not supportive of the team? The team members are going to say, okay, I'll just do my work and go. They're not going to pursue to be better in what they're doing, right? First thing, 
is prepare people. Right? When we see in the Azusa revival, classic example of the failure to prepare people. William J. Seymour, when, the, uh, when he started that small church, in that burnt out building on Azusa Street, hundreds of people started coming and then the revival broke out. Thousands of people started coming. He, he, he did one thing good. He, he had an organization. He had an organized team. He had leaders and all of that. Right? He had things set in place, but he did not prepare them. Like he had a, a, you know, a, a committee, he had pastoral teams and all of those things he had. He had an office, he had structure, but he didn't prepare them for the structure. Meaning what? They were not prepared to take on what was happening in the church. Now, it was, the church became a very big church, but conflicts arose within the mission. Disagreements, right? Oh, okay, we should not wear necklaces. Women should not wear necklaces. It's a sign of worldliness. That's what happened in the Azusa Street Revival. Then uh, we know that uh, that certain area uh, uh, was, would always see storms and uh, you know uh, snowstorms and all of that. And so they constructed a snow shelter. Right? Uh, and then people started saying, oh, this is a, uh, demonstrating lack of faith. And so we see that people... Uh, started competing with each other, theological disagreements over sanctification and all of these things. And the entire ministry had a very, very, very sad ending. At the end of uh, William J. Samo's ministry, he had about 12 people in his church. Now, was it his fault or was it God who decide, decided I'm going to you know, stop this revival. I would say that he could have planned and prepared his people. He could have taught his team members. This, this is something that we are as, as a church. This is what it is. He did not prepare his people. And so always remember, if we are in uh, ministry or even in the workplace, prepare your team people. Right. A wonderful thing that Moses did was, uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly, everywhere he went, he took, you know, uh, uh, Joshua with him. Joshua, and most, mostly it was Joshua, sometimes Joshua and Caleb. But Joshua was always with Moses. And so we see that Joshua was well prepared to take on the task that was ahead of him. It's not like Joshua saying, oh, what do I do now? Uh, I'm not sure what to do. Moses is gone. Uh, without Moses, I, I, I don't know what's the next step. No. What does he say? In Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, God speaks and says, Joshua, just don't be afraid. Go ahead. I'm with you. Go into the land that I promised you. Joshua didn't say, can you choose Caleb or can you choose somebody else? He knew. He was prepared. It's very important. Even Jesus did that wonderful thing where he, he prepared his disciples right? and he had that handful of them, Peter, James, and John. He prepared them. He said, there will come a time. He kept saying to them, hey, there'll come a time when people will mock you, people will ridicule you, people will beat you and put you into prison and all of these things. So you be prepared. I'm not going to be around, right? Uh, now the disciples were sad, right? Uh, if you if you remember reading uh, through the scriptures uh, uh, in the New Testament, you see the disciples were sad. Where are you going? Can we come along with you? But Jesus prepared them. He didn't give them a shock treatment, saying that, oh, okay, suddenly I'm not there, and the disciples don't know. No, he prepared them for the future. He told them, hey, I'm not going to be around. My time is short, and when I go, you have to take on the ministry ahead. And so it's very important to prepare. Just picture this. Imagine Jesus did not tell his disciples anything about his death. And all of a sudden we're seeing Jesus, they're seeing Jesus on the cross. And then they're all like, oh, what do we do now? We don't know what to do now. Right? It wasn't so. Right? If we see the scripture, they were sad. They were heartbroken that Jesus wasn't around. 
but we also see that they were prepared for what was ahead right they were prepared for what because they knew that hey we need to take this on further we need to spread this gospel to the different parts of the world be kingdom minded people right one of the things in abc that we always always stress on quite a few points one of them is being kingdom minded right not self you know thinking about our ourselves think about our own ministry but being our the mindset of being a uh, kingdom minded right uh it's very important where each of us pastors believers uh, you know one of the things we encourage our church folks is uh, you know if they want to go ahead and you know especially somebody who is new we encourage them if you want to go to you know other churches and see how they are if you feel comfortable go ahead right it's not a competition here even we also tell our church folks if there is any conferences or meetings that are happening within the city other ministries go ahead be part of their meetings if there's like a worship evening or a conference or they got a guest speaker if they want to go let them go right it's not about no you're an apc you have to be an apc no it's important to be you know uh, dedicated to your local church and serve in the local church but there will come times you would want to uh, you know be part of other special programs go ahead being becoming kingdom minded so we tell our church folks regardless of what we are doing we are all together working and building god's kingdom each one of us plays a role in sowing and reaping and harvesting right we all have a, a, a role three when we prepare people we need to prepare them and teach them not only for programs and events but we prepare them to focus on the presence of god right prepare them to focus on god's presence so it's not about okay one day i want to you know uh, become this great leader and teach the word of god in this church or i want to be uh, you know i want to prepare myself and then i know one day i will start leading worship in the church that's not the focus the focus should be god god i want you to build me i want my life to reflect who you are and so god's presence should be the focus and out of that will flow these other things like events programs all of that right remember paul writing to the first uh, to the thessalonians in first thessalonians 2:19 he says this wonderful wonderful thing he says you are our crown and our glory in heaven it's right into the believers he's saying you are our crown Uh, so if we look at it uh, you know if i was probably apostle paul i would say god my crown would be my first missionary journey and then even my second missionary journey because that was a difficult place and another crown is that uh, you know i'm a pharisee of the pharisees uh, i know the old testament by heart and now the new testament you know, i put it together and another crown would be all the epistles that i've written another crown would be this and that but what does paul say you are my crown you the people so when i go to heaven and i see you there that is my crown and it's not about the first missionary journey and second missionary journey and the churches that were started and all that happened to me during the mission it's not about that you the people are my crown right so train people to focus on god's presence and not on programs and agendas right remember this uh, when i joined bible college my my desire was i never thought i'll continue to you know uh, be in the ministry i always thought that i'll when i was working in the corporate sector i always thought okay i'll study for 2 years come back join the corporate sector and you know work here and also serve god it was always on my mind right and and so it was my focus was not okay this is what i want to become a pastor i want to do worship leading that was not the focus the focus was i wanted to equip myself so that i can share the gospel with people right 
and that I can live a holy life, live a life that's pleasing to God. That was a focus. And then out of that focus, God opened doors where we continued on in the ministry. Right. Next one, equip people to be disciples, not only to new believers, but to everyone. Equip people to be disciples. When we as leaders, we have leadership roles given to us, we are to equip people. One very, very important aspect that we point out or impress in people in our church is every believer is a minister, right? So ministry is not just, okay, you know, this is the name of the ministry. No. For example, if somebody in the church has a problem, they come to you and they say, hey, can you pray for me? And as you are praying and ministering to them, you are doing the ministry, right? It's, it's not, okay, I need to have a, you know, this church name and then the ministry name. I need the documents and uh, all of these things. No, no, no. When you and I are praying for each other, helping each other, teaching the word, giving the word of God to people, that in itself is ministry. So you and I, all of us, are a minister of God. None of us, in you know, that's what we say in APC. None of us can say that we don't, you know, we don't have anything to do. No, we all are ministers of God. We all, whether we are pastors, whether we are volunteers, whether we are leaders, everyone is a minister of God. Titles, all of this don't really matter to us. Right? And so when we equip people, we become we go and we become carriers of revival. I love what Jesus said. Rivers of living water shall flow out of you. Right? What's the characteristic of a river? It keeps flowing. What's the characteristic of a lake? Lake is always stagnant. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't flow. God is calling us to be rivers of living water, like not lakes. We're not called to be stagnant in one place. And we, if you see a stagnant lake, what is it that you, you notice? Probably smell and unwanted insects and mosquitoes and uh, not a good sight. But God is calling us to be a river. There should be a flow out of us. So we must be willing to go out of our comfort zone to release and impart to other people. Right? One of the things we do in APC is we ask the church folks, you know, pray for us as leaders. We are not super, super leaders or something where we don't have problems and don't have challenges. We all go through those. So we tell our church folks. There are times after church, I, I go to some of our elders and I say, hey, oh, uncle, auntie, can you pray for me? Just feeling weak or feeling tired. Oh, I just need your prayers. Nothing wrong in doing that. It's not like, okay, because I'm the pastor, I only should be praying for everyone and everyone should notice. No, no, no. We are called to minister to each other. Everyone, all of us, right? Be ready to make changes to accommodate uh, the move of God. Revival can disrupt our schedules, right? As I mentioned before, we have a plan. We work it out, right? Uh, uh, and then, according to the plan, if it goes according to plan, that's great. There'll be times God can disrupt that plan, right? It's all right. God is moving. So we be open and we accommodate. Uh, and then we prepare leadership teams to step in, right? Uh, to go and do anything that is needed. Uh, and we are not to hold on to positions, to titles, to roles, all of those things don't really matter. You know, one of the things in APC is we very rarely call each other pastor, except for our senior pastor. But we don't really do that. Right? We just call them by a name because title. The title is not really important. Right? Uh, if you notice in the books as well that we have, pastors' books, there's no pastor there. It's, it's just the name, and, and so we don't focus on all of those things. Those things don't matter. Oh, you didn't call me pastor. You didn't call me reverend. All those are just secondary. That should not cause anything. You know, they were at a time and age now where if you don't call 
person pastor or uh, prophet and all of that they get offended uh, uh, that's the truth but that should not be our priority our priority is that we are called to serve people right not to hold on to titles not to hold on to rules and our goal is to have god's presence in our lives also god's presence in the lives of people you know uh, maybe uh, what we can do is uh, uh, maybe after we finish this uh, session next week, next week or the week after that uh, i know that tarun is here in our class tarun's been uh, in the leadership team and he's done some wonderful wonderful works and he's raised up many leaders before he moved on to paris uh, so we can hear from him right than hearing from the leaders. we can hear from him how uh, how he raised up leaders and uh, you know just that whole mindset of working as a team so maybe we can uh, you know a few weeks from now we can also open it up and let tarun share and others also can share have a time of discussion all right so we've come to a close uh let's just close in prayer uh, any questions any thoughts uh, okay all right so let's close in prayer uh, and then we can get to another class let's pray father we want to thank you for this day and this time lord we thank you for what we studied today lord you are preparing each one of us even as we plan and prepare lord let your move let your holy spirit just empower us our hearts mind and our spirit lord that we will continue to minister and do everything that you have called us to do we thank you for each and every student and uh, i pray lord that you will continue to strengthen them and lead them in your ways oh god we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray amen 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 god bless you all have a wonderful day we'll see you tomorrow god bless